we all have our ups and downs. We all have our, our wonderful, joyous times oh, yeah. when we're smiling and happy, joyous, and free. And then there's times when, when we're all just hurting. And it's how you deal with that hurt that is what I'm trying to explore in this work and with these benches and tables. Welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Today we have my friend, longtime friend now for, geez, 15 plus years, Derek Preble, uh, one of the, easily one of the best furniture maker, cabinet makers, woodworkers, and artists that I personally know for sure. Um, very passionate about what you do, and uh, it's always been I don't know what the right word is, but uh, you've always been very creative and passionate and involved with whatever you're doing. So it's always been an interesting conversation talking to you about whatever you're working on at the moment. <laughs> and we recently photographed your last project uh, here in the studio, the first thing we shot in the studio a while ago, which I want to talk about as well. And we have another guest today, Coco, as well, who's very well-mannered. <laughs> But anyways, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks. There's Coco. What are you up to these days? I'm building uh, a master closet for one of my best clients. Um, he sent me a picture of something he liked, which is what usually happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I drew it up and submitted it and... And we worked on the surfaces. It's a rift sawn white oak with a dark stain, which we usually don't do. White oak with a dark stain. That yeah. seems like opposites. I know. We usually don't we usually don't do a lot of a lot of staining at all. But hmm. in this case, it's 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 what he wanted. So and how did you get into woodworking from the very beginning? Like why did you choose woodworking and I started woodworking because I loved playing with toy guns in the woods with my friends. So it started by making yeah. better toy guns. I made, I made, and I know you like guns, so you can oh. appreciate this. Um, I made replicas of M16s and AK-47s and Uzis <laughs> because I was a boy that loved guns. I was a little warrior sure. kid. Um, and I was very competitive. And one of my other friends was making guns as well in his um, garage. And when he saw my gun, the first thing he did was, was smash it into bits because it was, it was a lot nicer <laughs> what than the guns nice he friend. was making. And uh, it was kind of funny. So you knew you had yeah, these things at that point. Well, the funny thing is, is that I, I was, I didn't really have a lot of tools and I was really young. So I was using my dad's like grinder, which he sharpened axes with and stuff. Yeah. Like it's one of those bench grinders with two wheels. Right. Right. And I was using that to grind all the parts. And of course, the, the stone was filling up with the wood dust immediately. So you're was, polishing wood eventually, pretty much. It was burning, and so, hey, Coco, go lay down. Sit. Down. Good girl. So, yeah, that's how it started. And they were really, they were real. They really looked like the real thing. And luckily, you didn't get shot by the cops. So, Cape Porpoise no. is pretty chill, though. Yeah, so. Cape Porpoise is easy, you know, <laughs> easy going. Place. Do you know what kind of wood you were making them out of? Pine, 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 and, and two by fours. That's all I had. So, how did you graduate from that to actually? Because you like we, from your early twenties went directly into woodworking. We it was way before then. Um, we we started. Um, I say we. Um, my parents. Uh, were told by my, we had industrial arts then in junior high school. Mm -hmm. So in seventh grade, the industrial arts teacher called my parents and said, I'm really having a hard time with Derek. He's, he's a really difficult 
he's a really difficult kid. Um, and uh, he's also really talented. But yeah, but I'm having a hard, a hard time with his behavior. So my father spoke with me about it, and I uh, I started to like this teacher. His name was Mr. Mayo. And um, or no, it was Marrow, I think actually, but it doesn't matter. So I sort of got what do you call it when you get channeled? And focused, so, channeled. Uh, yeah, it's, no, there's a, like, there's like a, everyone was schools. like, Derek, you should really go into woodworking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was like my gift. Right. And it's been sort of a pigeonholed. Yeah. I mean, pigeonholed is a m little more negative than. Right. Well, back in, back in those days, there, there was home economics and there was industrial arts. They would have considered woodworking industrial arts. Yeah. And we had steel and wood. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would go an extra, I, I had an extra class every day in that to try to help with the behavior stuff. And, um, you know, he just, he just went to my, he went to my family at one point and just said, I had a lot of talent for somebody my age. Hmm. Yeah. I think it was just, I had good instincts. So what were some of the, uh, first things you started making that, that made you realize like this is what i'm going to do i didn't realize it was what i was going to do i always fought it to be honest with you i was really more interested Why? i was really more interested in psychology and um, that is fun stuff i was more interested in um so i was especially interested in sociology hmm. um but i didn't have the academic um discipline to to, to sit still to, to for that, that long stuff. and blank memorization of all the things that you have to yeah blank memorize yeah <laughs> so um i remember very clearly in um sophomore or junior year of high school being called up for for an award for achievement in industrial arts and i was really embarrassed because Why? it was in front of the whole school and um because industrial arts was the like industrial arts was, industrial arts was considered um at that time there wasn't a lot of romance to it it was more right. like what what the kids that weren't smart enough to <laughs> to do other stuff did. just put them in the <laughs> and um Yeah, so I, I also had perfect attendance. In, in industrial arts no, or the in rest school. of school. Now, if you were a difficult kid, how'd you end up having perfect attendance? That's, that's where, like, I'm not sure if it really should be a part of what we're talking about today, but that's been my life. It's like, I always show up, but it doesn't mean I'm happy where I am. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I showed up to school every day, freshman, sophomore, and junior year. I skipped a fair amount if I, I, did, if I could. I, <laughs> I wanted to go to school. I wanted to see the other kids. Huh. And then um, I don't remember your question. Doesn't I think matter. it had to do with like. Like what were some of the first things you were making? That yeah, I, the projects. I remember getting up early before school and working on some bookshelves for my sister. Because my father started to support my s talents. He bought a table saw, a craftsman table saw. Um, he taught me how to use it. And um, my great, great grandfather and grandfather were both builders. My great grandfather was an architect. My grandfather mm. was a, a good craftsman. I still have their tools. Um, of course, you know that I grew up in a fish market with a fish yeah. market in my backyard. Preble Fish Company. Yeah. So um, at a very young age, I was repairing the, the boxes used to be wood that the fish would come in. 100-pound ah. boxes. And right. I used to repair those when I was a little boy. Hmm. 
that was the first time I ever picked up a handsaw and a hammer and nail. I was probably like five years old. So in in shop class, industrial arts essentially, is that where they taught you about all the different weird characteristics of wood and everything else? Or where'd you start to get more uh, um, of that well, real knowledge of woodworking? Um, an older gentleman used to come to the fish market a lot and my brother spoke with him and said, hey, my, my younger brother's actually really talented. Would you, would you ever want to talk to him? And I went by his house and talked to him. And so I would go to his house after school and help him with, uh, he, he was making period furniture in Kenny Bunkport. Really? Which is like, you know, Queen Anne, you know, ball and claw stuff. Like Cheers. out of raw wood. Out of mahogany. Wow. But he was really, um, he had a, some sort of neurological condition where he would, he would shake as he was cutting. So he had me cut for him. Hmm. And, um, so was he, he would, sculpting like the yeah. toes and balls? Yeah, he was amazing. Wow. I know some people in town who still have his furniture. Hmm. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. And then I, uh, started working for an antique repair, um, business in West Kenny Bunk and a cabinet maker in Kenny Bunk. I worked for a cabinet maker for a while. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> it was a dark period in my life. Yeah. It's hard for me. Yeah. I, uh, did your cabinet shop have no windows and run a forklift all day in it? And uh, oh. I was yelled at all day. Yeah. They yelled at me too. But yeah. It was, it was probably for, it, that's where I learned, um, <laughs> some of the stuff that I've had to unlearn <laughs> the yelling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the oh man, the, it was weird for me working in a in a wood shop because there. It, it wasn't what I was. I didn't have the the things that you point out that are so interesting about woodworking and all that. I just didn't naturally have those interests that helped me see those things. Yeah. Um, and the people, you know, they would just put me in the back chopping, you know, one foot lengths of something all day long or sweeping the entire shop up or, and I'm just a terrible employee to begin with. So it was, yeah. Well, that's <laughs> one of the reasons why I'm where I am, I am because I'm, I'm unemployable too. Yeah. I, there, there's yeah. some kind of commonality between people that have some degree of creativity that are also sometimes unemployable but i don't i don't necessarily know that it's th the creative side of the personality that makes them unemployable but i find this in my oldest son that unless he's genuinely interested in something he doesn't really put forth much effort but if he's interested in something he's just all in that's that's the obsessiveness of the artist um the perfectionist yeah um I've been obsessed with what I'm interested in my whole life. Um, there's not a lot of balance there, so it leads to some issues. No. Um, people have to be understanding around me. Um, like I'll buy, if I find a pair of boots that I like, I buy two or three pair. Um, my wife kind of does that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Like if I, if I find a pair, of, I don't know. If I find some wood that I like, I tend to hoard it. Like I, I have like, a, like a, there's a really special material right now that I'm using in my furniture and I'm, and people are asking me what it is and I'm, I'm finding myself being a little bit secretive about it. So it's um, kind of like secret spots to a degree in surfing and yes, it is now, very much so. When you see a purse, a piece of wood and you're like, Oh, what? I've, like everyone else sees wood. I've always loved, I've always loved wood ever since I was a little boy. I love the smell of it. I love the feel of it. Um, I don't mind being dusty. Um, a lot of people that I've worked for have tried to work in the shop and they don't like the feeling of the dust in their fingers really bothers them or picking up a pair a piece of steel wool really bothers some people hmm. um chemicals can bother some people 
And you just you just love all that because it means you're working with wood. Yeah, I like it. Hmm. But like what? I like watching the wood change. I'll just I'll be working with a piece of wood and I'll just wipe it down with water as I'm working, just so I can see the grain. Right. Because I just want to see how it's going to be like how it's really going to pop. Right. So when you spot a piece of wood, though, because uh, you had shown me some some I think some really big. Yeah, pieces those of slabs wood are like 20 that, feet long, and I, I've earmarked them for like a, a conference table for somebody someday. Right. They're, and, um, they're 20 foot long. They're, um, they're reclaimed. And it's, it's some of the coolest wood I've ever seen. And what kind of wood was that? Well, I didn't want to say. Oh, I'm okay. keeping it a secret. All right. <laughs> nice. I'll tell you. You want me to tell later you? off camera? Okay. No, I'll tell you. I, I, I wouldn't even know why, why it would be like, why would it be secret? And I, it, it shouldn't be. And I probably should get over this part of myself. Um, I've been hungry in business my whole life. So I've had a competitive mm -hmm. vibe going on. Um, And I always want to. I always want to be doing something that I. I like to feel like I'm doing something that other people aren't doing yet. Sure. Like I'm on. Like That's I a wanna, personality I wanna feel trait like I'm, that a lot I of. I feel like I'm on the for, You know the. The frontier of, or the. I want to. I want to feel like I'm driving point. The truth is, I'm probably not. Um. It's really. It's really. A, we're getting into uh, there's nothing new under the sun but exactly there's yeah. a there's a personality aspect and i have i have the same thing driving me where it's like if you're like everybody else you're not contributing anything and you are not worth anything is what my head yeah tells it's me. ego is what it is yeah very much so yeah. and and it's a really hard thing to struggle against to keep balance in your life as far as like you know, Trent, stop spending all this time focusing on work and just take it a little easier. Spend time with your kids and be present and stop thinking about the next thing you're going to do that's going to try and make you relevant somehow or yeah. whatever. And that's that's a really hard thing when you have, you know, a family and kids and everything else. It It, it adds to, you know, the degree at which you can fail at other parts of your life that you need to be, you know, present for. But at the same time, it's it's some kind of drive or hunger that, um, you know, pushes innovation, creativity um, and productivity as well. It's it's a it's a good thing to have. And I see it. It's a curse and a good thing to have. But it's it's kind of why I think everyone has it um, to some degree when they're younger. There's that angst of youth and everything else. And I think that's where like rock music comes out of um and that's why as you know people get in their 30s and 40s that are rock musicians are like still releasing albums and they're just they're usually falling flat if they're still pulling from that same attempting to come from a place of angst and and everything else of that thing that's more tied to youth that's that real um youthful angst of that type of energy um you're yeah you're you're talking about um, a slightly different thing that we're talking about. No, but you're it's a talking similar about thing. immature energy versus mature energy. Right, um, but I think we we have, and I've seen it in a lot of other people. This, it's still that energy that that is kind of um, hard to elaborate on too much, but it's still that energy under underneath pushing you. Yeah. Really pushing you. Because I run into some people who are like, I interact with them. And I'm like, man, you're probably a really pleasant person to be around most all the time. And that makes me think like my poor wife has to be around me and all my grumpy moods where mm -hmm. I'm, I'm disturbed because of all this stuff going on in my head. And I get uh, just not necessarily directly angry or anything else but like i was talking to a friend of mine the other day and he says sometimes you just wake up and i see that you have this look in your eye like i'm going to agitate things today 
just to see what comes out of it, you know, and I've, I've gotten old enough where I can, I can sense that in myself and, and, you know, protect people from it. Um, but there, there's definitely something there that's part of a creative energy, that's part of a drive, that's part of a drive to succeed, a drive to be different because my mind tells me if I'm not different, I'm not contributing somehow, you know? And, mm-hmm. and I, don't, I don't, you know, that's why you were saying psychology and I find it interesting because uh, it's, it's complex that there's certain people that act more like the bread for the world which is so important and then there's other people that are like the tabasco sauce you know that they put on the sandwich you know and then some are the jalapeno peppers and some are the tomatoes and some are the cheese you know it's it's yeah the whole thing and each serves its part so a whole a whole sandwich of just tabasco would really not be that nice so (laughs) so you think i'm the hot sauce now because my latest piece is a hot sauce cabinet Really? Yeah. Tell me about that. Cause I'm, uh, it's, I almost brought it with me today. Really? And maybe if, we do, another, if we do another segment, I'll bring the hot sauce cabinet and we can set it on the table. Who's this? And, um, wait, to what degree you can talk about it? Who's, who's this for? Honestly, I got the idea for a hot sauce cabinet from one of my employees from about eight or 10 years ago. And um, he had just gotten out of... Uh, Afghanistan and he went to the main college of art for woodworking and I hired him Mm -hmm. and he was a wonderful man and I went to his house and he showed me his version of a hot sauce cabinet and I always it for first of all I thought it was really cool that hot sauce was so important to him that he made a cabinet especially for it and it it also was a beautiful cabinet. I don't remember everything about it. I think it had a little curved front. So I've been messing with this Mondrian, you know, taking all these older woods and newer woods and just sort of making these, these tile looking patterns for a long time. And I made a door and I put it in a cabinet. And uh, I, I intend on putting my hot sauces it. So how do and you maybe some, some how's a hot you know, sauce how's a hot sauce like cabinet different than is it just narrower and it only it like has one thing yeah it's deep only about or? it's really only about six inches deep yeah um at the most and it's it's small but it, I'm at this point in my career that that's the sort of thing I'm really into doing hmm. I really want to be able to carry my pieces in to a house really easily. I want to be able to hang them on the wall in like five minutes. Um, so you're eventually just going to graduate to like jewelry boxes. Just to I don't want to like- do the jewelry box thing. No, but, um, that brings me to a whole other, other thing about craft. I'm not in, I, I don't, I don't really want to do the intricate. Why not stuff anymore? Talk to me. <laughs> it, Studio furniture making doesn't interest me anymore. I'm burnt out on it. Um, I, I'm working with Live Edge reclaimed materials right now, and it's really uncomfortable. I don't like Live Edge. All right. I think it's important to work with materials that are difficult aesthetically unpleasing because it if you've been doing woodworking as long as I have it it sort of puts me in a place where I'm discovering techniques and stuff and I'm seeing I'm seeing the wood um, in a different way. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. I'm taking the bark off the tree. Mm-hmm. Some guys don't even take the bark off these days. With live edge stuff? Yeah. Yeah. 
I've always been dealing with square stuff that comes, you know, S4S or it doesn't come S4S, but it comes rough. Oh, S4S. Meaning it's dressed on all four sides. Gotcha. Um, um, smooth, but, you know, it, not, not perfect, but. It's interesting in my interactions with you and how you talk about what you do and what and everything else you, you relate to it. It seems very deeply and almost metaphorically. It's, it's a, like you're working through therapy in what you're doing. Something happened last year with me that it was, it was a breakthrough personally and okay ever since I was a little boy I built things with Legos or with blocks and then I said look at what I did and I got my self esteem from that right like oh we're we're so proud of you. You did such a nice job, you know, good boy. Right. Um, so the perfectionism and the obsession continued. And I remember when I was in my early twenties and I was working with a lot of cherry. Um, this is back in the early nineties. And Cherry was the wood. Cherry was the bomb in the 90s. Yeah. And the, um, now when people ask for Cherry, I know they're in their 80s. Um, and that's okay. I haven't worked with Cherry in quite a while. Um, but back to the, the, the perfectionism. I used to cut the sap wood out of the Cherry. The sapwood is the outside of the tree, mm. and the wood is pale in color, and... And that's where the water and everything's still flowing. Yeah. Mainly, right? Okay. Yeah. It's the living part of the tree. That's why you can find trees that are kind of hollowed out at yeah. the bottom and raccoons live in them or whatever, yeah. and the tree's still, like, fine. Yeah. yeah. But don't start asking me about that kind of stuff, because my education is not probably not tight enough that I'm actually going to be, someone yeah. might be laughing somewhere. Uh, there's xylem, phloem, all that, you know. Right. Um, so I'm cutting out all the sap wood. I'm cutting out all the defects, no knots. And that to me was beautiful at that time. Um, I built blanket chests, uh, kitchens, dining tables, sideboards, so many things out of cherry during that time. And perfect cherry at that. I burned one third of the cherry that I bought. I remember building my first kitchen for a woman in Kenny Bunkport out of cherry. I bought 400 board feet of cherry and I had to go buy more. And it was a small kitchen and I did it just so I could buy a planer. So I got the first check and went and bought the planer, went and bought the cherry and then worked for free for like five weeks. Right. Well, I didn't work for free. I worked for seven. I built a kitchen for about $700 for a $700 reliant planer made in Taiwan. Nice. Still have it? No. Now I now have like a, a very fancy planer made in Italy. Fancy boy planer. Yeah. I'm still addicted to tools. They have to be like sure. European and... <laughs> You know, are the European tools as unreliable as European no, cars? No, they're more reliable than American tools, huh. and they are. The steel that they use is of the quality that holds the bearings, the bearing seats, and everything better. Hmm. So there's no vibration. They work to oh, a tighter tolerance. That, they okay, also gotcha. have finishing okay. figured out. We don't. So we've been using Italian water-based finishes for a long time too. All right, sorry, back but, to the, the so cherry the and the perfectionism. Having everything look perfect carried into my career until last year. And part of me is still doing the perfect stuff and still dealing with 
honestly, I'm dealing with clients who really want perfect stuff. Mm -hmm. They often want white. So sometimes we build something out of maple and we paint it white. Sure. Um, it's, you know, it almost looks like plastic when we're done because of the lacquer and stuff. Right. And I don't mind it. I like, I especially like it when there's wood mixed with it. it sort of pops the wood a little bit better. <laughs> like if you go to a museum, the walls are white. Like these walls are white. Yeah. It looks like my house. <laughs> yeah. I but will. when you put a piece of art on there. Yeah. It pops. Yeah. So a lot of times I just want my stuff to go away. I just want my work. Sometimes it needs to be subordinate. Yeah. And that's my job to listen to people and figure out whether they want everything to be blingy or not. Right. And right now I'm dealing with somebody who's blingy and she doesn't want a white kitchen. And she realized that halfway through. And now we're going to, we're going to do something special with the surface. She doesn't want, she went white kitchen and now doesn't want white yeah. kitchen. And she kind of changed her mind a little bit. I think that Jake and I had sort of the builder guy, you know. Yeah. Another surfer. So, Another surfer. Yeah. Um, yeah, we sort of said, hey, you know, let's have this kitchen match the trim. And she is this went the one out in Biddeford Pool towards it the is. end? Yeah, it's cool. right out on the ocean there. Yeah. Um, so... That's what I do in that when I'm when I'm doing that, yeah, okay, I'm there. So last year at this time exactly, and this is it's it's one year to the day practically. Um I realized that I needed to work on myself. I needed to grow. I needed to grow or I needed to stop living. There was just, it was, it was just. That's a difficult point. It was really hard. I was hurting and it had to do with what you were referring to earlier, like being present and wanting to be, okay, I want to hang out with my kids. Well, for me, it was about being present for partners, my friends, family, and most importantly, um, my girlfriend at the time. So I started to look at that because we were no longer together. And I was very confused and I went to speak with um, one counselor and then I went to another counselor and I started to learn about um, I started to learn that I was emotionally probably a lot younger than I really than I am I mean you know physically Everyone does things at their own pace. So I decided I wanted to grow up. And I was still confused and hurting, and I didn't know what to do. So I went to the wood shop, and I started taking all the scrap wood that I collected and putting it together in those Mondrian patterns. I call them Mondrian patterns. I mean, they're, they're not primary colors. They're not... It's, it, it just It is inspired um, by by that kind of thing though. Um, so I started playing with the wood and I hadn't played with the wood in a long time. It was serious before. And it was, it was actually, part of, part of it was fun, but sometimes I was actually sad you know, there I, I I was listening to some music. I was alone in my shop, and I was crying. Um, I built 
some coffee tables and some benches that you photographed. And for the first time, I thought I was doing something for... I thought I was doing something a little bit more artistic, to be honest with you. Yeah, I would say it was completely artistic. I've never seen... I've never seen uh, craftsmanship have as much of an effect in an in an in an emotional way yeah. as what you did. So I would move that from craftsmanship to yeah. art. Yeah, and that's just that's just that's just where I realized I I was probably missing I was probably missing that part of myself for so long. I was I was um I was focused on design and craft, but I wasn't actually uh, communicating any emotion through woodworking. And, and it's really, I, I think it's really hard to do that um, because I'm, you know, I'm trying to give some, someone a utilitarian piece. And so that's why I've kept it sort of low key with the benches and the coffee tables. And sometimes it's just wall hanging stuff like, yeah, but yeah. the what you did with that one bench, the the better together and and how they match each other and they came from the same piece, if I'm remembering it correctly. Oh, uh, there's there's a bunch of different matches. Um I was focused on matching. Um butt matches, book matches, uh slip matches. Um I was trying at first to explore the idea of twos. Um, I wasn't devastated by the loss of just one person last year. I was devastated by the fact that I had been inadequate as a, as a lover and a friend um, my entire life. Hmm. So it all, it, all came, it all came down at once. The whole, the whole, like, the, the box that I had built, that I had my life in for my safety, my own, my own emotional safety, right. was very, it was very strong, very complex, and it, it all came apart after I realized that I didn't, really have a clue about how to share myself with another person and share my life in a um in a in a way that most people naturally are able to do and and that you know it goes way back to when I was a kid I was fascinated with sociology and I was fascinated with psychology and all this stuff. Does and now it tie I'm finally into able to the like, perfectionism of oh, yeah, the cherry totally. and how you were working yeah. in the past? How's, how do those relate? Uh, well, it's really obvious, actually, how they relate. Um, the, what happens with people and young people, I, I think, and my, my, uh, I, my sister told me that she noticed it with her boys actually. Um, and you may notice it with your boys at some point in time. There's, there's a, there's a day when they, they start to put a mask on and they Hmm. become a little bit afraid to be who they are. And they start, they start to try to, um, put a little different, uh, spin on things. Because they don't want to be vulnerable. Yeah, they start to develop a veneer that they think, yeah, the vulnerability kind yeah. of like, maybe yeah. I shouldn't be so vulnerable all the time. Yeah. So yeah. I was, and my clients are all the time trying to put out, especially the white kitchen people. They're trying to put out this, my life is perfect. Everything's perfect. Everything's perfect. We're at the beach, you know, I spent a lot of money on this house. We're all going to have a good time. <laughs> Everything's perfect. Right. Listen. Yeah, yeah. It is not like that for anyone. No, nobody Nobody has nobody. Nobody. We all have our ups and downs. We all have our our wonderful, joyous times when we're smiling and happy, joyous and free. And then there's times 
when, when we're all just hurting and it's how you deal with that hurt that is what I'm trying to explore in this work and with these benches and tables. You f I'm trying to face it, work through it for the first time in my life. Um, I think it has a lot, there's a lot of, uh, this has a lot to do with addiction issues. It has a lot to do with, um, it's all, it's all about relationships. And, uh, I've, in, in all of my searching through like changing of my, you know, worldview, perception, faith, and everything else, I keep coming back to the idea that it's not that everything's relative as much as everything's relational. Exactly. It, it, everything is, in my opinion, fairly relative, uh, but even more importantly, it's all relational. Even if you're talking about just simple materials, it's how they relate. And when it comes to people, it is about relationship. And if, if you're constantly focusing, for me, I, I, I see it in the light that if I'm constantly focusing on how I'm perceived relating to the world and my importance to those that aren't really uh, the closest to me that I'm in true relationship with, I'm actually taking from the people who need me the most to up my own social credibility or whatever else in the eyes of those who matter or who need the least from me, really. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's interesting that you point that out because I noticed that um, my behavior was at its absolute worst when two years ago I made a pledge to myself to make this relationship work. This is the one, Derek, don't mess this up. Like, do take the walks on the beach, take the time, um, give of yourself. And I, and I noticed that at work, I was incredibly angry and I was mean to some of the people I work with. But when I went home at night, I was good to my partner. But then I started to explain to my partner, I said, I'm having a hard time at work. I'm being really judgmental. Um, I'm really short fused. And uh, I was blaming the other people, but it was really about me not having enough to, uh, I didn't have enough love for myself because all my self-esteem, remember, was coming from the work. The work and the ideas of perfection within yeah. that work. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And, and that's why hmm. so many people who are, you know, brilliant actors, just all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, this guy blew his head off? Like, what's up with that? Well, I, you know, and like, to what I was saying earlier, I think people that are some there's something to the 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 almost a dichotomy of if you achieve so much in these realms that give to these parts of your life that aren't the close relationships you're taking from oh yeah the, you your are. your availability and your close in you know in in that area and you're putting it out here to achieve and have you know to raise yourself really to a pedestal but for the people who, who need you most you're you're stealing from them and i think the people that really really make a genuine difference um are the ones who find the most truth and meaning with those close to them that are able to passive almost passively pass that understanding along into what they do which i think is exactly what you're doing with that latest piece is that you found you know all of this striving towards perfection and cutting out all the unique and you know odd things that are in these you know, pieces of cherry that you were working with. You're cutting out all the things that really make them real 
and yeah. interesting and, and everything else. And you're just keeping the perfection, uh, you know, yeah, I think that's really interesting to see the maturation of a person and how that translates into their creativity and how they work and everything else to, to, to see that visually. And I think that's why connected so much with what you were showing me with, with everything you're we're doing there and the the story behind it was was really interesting yeah i i have to admit i was a little bit disappointed when i put the work in a window um i was i was disappointed mostly in myself for not preparing well enough um but i wanted I wanted to mainline that into the viewer. I wanted I wanted people to look at the benches and read what I had read the words that I'd put in them. Because mm-hmm. I, I was actually, you know Yeah, yeah. Stamping stamping messages in them and stuff, which isn't normal. But I felt like I needed a little bit more just a just a little bit more t- to be able to communicate. And I and I also had this little you know, the little price thing that I wanted to do where it was like a set price right. and it's like a set. Okay. Here's, here's a message. Well, see, there's um, all the conflict again. You're yeah, like yeah. all that process of what you put into those pieces is your personal life and what you have to do in what you know best of, you know, woodworking. Um, but then there's this bridge over to a completely different world of turning it into people handing you pieces of paper that a government has stamped something on that's validated by yeah. gold that doesn't even exist to back it up you know the in it it uh it's one of those things that is in my opinion more the truest sense and of creativity and art and everything else that the value in it is a hundred percent in the expression of the artist and their life experience. And it might not be something that's valued until someone really comes across it and sees it for what it is because they just happen to have the time with it or hear the story and value it in that sense. And it's just not something that translates into walking by in a window, you know, it's not that kind of thing. Yeah. I haven't really, properly promoted it um i hope to actually um use a runway um with this line i want to um use models um i want i want the work to be up and and watch people relate to one another while they're like you use people in a lot of your photography you've been doing that it's been one of your signature things um I remember 15 years ago when we first started, I I would get in the pictures and and you were and my actually first, very first paying client. You paid me something like yeah, maybe like 15 or 50 bucks to go somewhere. Oh, out on Ocean Avenue. Yeah, yeah it was on the it's north side of Gucci's Beach. I yeah, think somewhere that's in Ocean there. Ocean Avenue in Kingpunk yeah. Port. Yeah. yeah, that was one of the first kitchens that I did. I had like little light bulbs in a in a aluminum thing it was like they were, the, up the pictures a... were so red and so dark and they were <laughs> i still have them on my shooting, computer shooting wood is is very difficult because of the color tones and the depths of things yeah. and yeah you've you've come a long way trent hopefully i have to say i'm i'm blown away by how good you've gotten at what you do um so yeah you asked me why i'm not into craft anymore um I wouldn't There's say you're so not into craft, beautiful. but it's not like your focus. It's like I think you've it's probably just close. gotten it and moved on. I did. I know. I. I honestly. I. I go when I go on the internet and look at what people half my age are doing right now with wood. I'm blown away. I'm so impressed. I'm so impressed with where we're at with with craft right now and and it's just some of the some of the chairs especially i just they blow my mind 
And I think they're really beautiful. I'm just not there myself. I'm still uncomfortable. And I'm now trying to um, communicate that tension. Um, I do think that people will want to sit on my benches. And I think that people will want to put their feet up on my coffee tables. And, and they'll want them in their home. But they're not, they're not as uh, perfect as the work that I once produced. I is. think that's where that, that is you. I was listening to a, a podcast yesterday where they're talking about, you know, when, when people start to ask the really deep questions of life and, you know, what do, what do I mean? What's it all mean that it's kind of, it's, it's an extremely important question to ask, but it's also uh, not frivolous, but, but pointless because you, you matter nothing and you matter everything like you are not explainable unless there's an entire universe built around you because to say the words Derek Preble, mm -hmm. you have to be able to say Bitterford, Maine, United States of America, you know, earth and that, you know, you have all these things that culminate to, you know, explain you which also puts you at the same point of like just a speck in amongst trillions of other things. So you're like, you're everything and you're nothing at the same time. Um, and that's why the act of creativity and expressing what is truly your experience, you know, I think is so important because it's that dance between meaning nothing, meaning everything and sharing what is uniquely your experience, you know? And, and I think the more that people come through the difficult process that you're coming through, the difficult process that, that I've had to come through in, in multiple areas of my life as well, you know, realizing that I was pretty selfish and self-centered husband, uh, you know, that, that had a lot of growing to do and, and a lot of changing to do and, didn't really discover that until, you know, I'll, I confirmed it with a lot of people, <laughs> you yeah. know, but, and that's mm. very uncomfortable, very shaming, very You're not as bad as you think you are, Trent, that uh, <laughs> it's, you know, that it's a really difficult process. But on the other side, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of beauty in being able to share that and to, to grow from it there there's a new there's a new perspective to see from and you see so much more you know and by what you're doing there's going to be people that connect with that i mean people that connect with that that difficulty of seeing the you know the idea of this this was one thing uh you know that's now been separated but it was originally one piece and, you know, it was better together. And, and there's so many truths for you that come out of that, that then translates into someone else's life who might not have the exact same truth, but it's going to have some depth of connection to it. And it's going to mean a lot to them. You know, there, there's something there that is the unique experience. That's so incredibly valuable that, that is creativity and art, I think. Yeah, what you talked about with relational stuff is um it's it's really important. I I don't really want to be on an island and create work and and uh have no one see it. I don't build what I build for me. I build what I build. Dog has a really bad burps. I build <laughs> I build what I build for the same reason that I've always built what I build. I want to make people happy. And as I know that sounds off maybe from what we're talking about, but it's just the truth. I do it with, I do it with people in mind. When I, when I made Walking With You, which is 
probably the most powerful piece in that line. I told you I, I was doing the twos thing. Mm -hmm. Twos don't always work in art. Most people are into the threes thing. And that's a whole like thing for like art school, whatever, right. you know? So I thought I had some subordinate and dominant features in this piece. I thought it was working, but the bench really wasn't. It, it, it also, um, I had left one of the squares really square and you came by the shop and said, I don't think that works. I would, I would sculpt it in. And I was like, but that's new wood and that's old wood. And I don't want to do that. And it's not, no, it's not what I'm doing. Well, I'm listening to people. This is a sharing thing. This is something where I'm listening because you know what? A couple weeks later, I said, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to sculpt that in a little bit on that edge and I'm going to leave the end square. And you were right. It started to work better. It still didn't work. So I go out and I see my former partner's new partner walking the dog that I had, that, that I had gone to the animal welfare society and adopted with my former partner. Mm. And I literally, I was, this was the, the moment where I realized I had an idea that I was inadequate. I had an idea that I was emotionally um, 16, 15 years old, maybe. That's when I realized that I was just another person who was really, really hurt. I was really hurting. And I went back to my shop and I cut the bench in half. And I added two legs to each half. And I finally realized that there's an impermanence to life and to everything that we have. That lesson was never really taught to me because I had a model of like, you stay together, you stay together, you stay together through thick and thin. You do whatever you can do to stay together. That's the, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I cut the bench in half and the bench is now a diptych and it's the most powerful thing I probably ever made because I sh I'm, I'm like saying, okay, these, these two benches belong together and they'll be together forever. Hopefully maybe they'll move apart in a, in a room Two people can sit on them separately. But when you put them together, they look like one and it's beautiful. And there is a permanence to that. And as an artist, I can, I can communicate that permanence, but they're separate. They're now free from one another. It's that one bench has become two. And I think that pain that I felt and the jealousy, envy, and, and just all the negative feeling. I mean, we all want to be, we all want to be like, Oh, I'm so happy for, for you that you have someone else. I'm so happy for you that, the dogs walk that he loves the dog and the dog loves him. Right. You know, I'm watching my old dog, like Ugh. look up at, at him. Like he's like the best thing ever. Right. And you know, it was hard. Mm. So finally I'm able to actually do something with my work to, to not just communicate that, but to also, um, to process it to uh, grieve through building furniture. It's pretty weird. No, they, the you creative know? process and, and what you, you know, what you create from your experience, you know, it is your voice. And, and uh, 
think there's a lot of people that connect and and it gives it gives it that deeper groundswell of meaning you know imbued into something that i think a lot of people are looking for because you can get you know the things you surround yourself with if they're all just stamped out of a mold somewhere that well that's we talked about that a few weeks ago at uh caleb's house sitting around his coffee table i just pointed at it and i was like there's a probably a million of these coffee tables no it was your coffee table i think it was our our well yeah we have a table that was stamped yeah. out but we we now have a table that you built yeah, yeah that has a lot of memories on it that i got from some friends that i don't want to ooh, you yeah. don't want to refinish it that sentimental side of you is really uh it's something that i don't see that often the guy that like go, goes through surfboards like the well way it's you a do different and thing different things like it's like yeah i know it, it really is those were i have to be honest with you man i peaked out i peaked out in those days when i built that table i'm still i'm still thinking like geez what happened you know like what happened like we we were all hanging out together and we were all young and, and it was like, uh, those were, those were good days and it's nice to be able to look back at it. And so of course you don't want to erase that. Yeah. I, I'm, I mostly see it as like, when I look at the table now and it has a lot of imperfections in it and everything else. And I could just, you know, go and perfect the table by sanding all those little marks that those yeah. little hands. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, I, know. I can't do that. I, I, I think you've nailed it with that, man. The wood that, um, you know, I don't know if this helps or hurts, but I, I think that, I think that the wood that I'm using, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to save all the, the defective pieces. I have a library of defective wood now that I used to burn, you know, now it's like, what happened to this? Um, well, it held up a building for 300 years. Um, it, or it was even part, you know, part of that tree that had a piece of barbed wire growing through it or something that, yeah. Yeah. It's just so, but it's, you know, it gets even deeper when it's, when it's your own life and the little hands um and you know all the friday nights that that you know the pizza nights and the you know the amazing the amazing meals and just the conversation um and there's nothing better than playing with other people's kids you know for me you know it's like um It's, it's scary to go back to that, you know, every, every artistic thing that we do, we, I think we need to, um, access a child. We access our, our little child inside of us. Mm. And it's, yeah, it's I'm really always, crazy. I'm always gravitating towards a, a compositional perspective that's lower. And my take on it is that you're looking from a perspective when you were at a height where you trusted everything. Oh my God. Yeah. That's amazing. And cause you can look from up higher at a living yeah. room setting and it, I never it just of doesn't that. have the same effect as if you bring the camera down just above sofa level. Yeah. And you know, like right at about four, four and a half feet, it's got this different, like, Oh yeah, that's, I connect to that. And, that's like when the world, everything was still magical. Yes, and before the masks came out. Yeah. Like I was talking about earlier when you started getting hurt, things started to hurt a little bit. I don't know what it is, man. I think it's... Uh, yeah. I mean, that's a that's a really incredible time in life that you you start to realize that at that point that life can hurt. Mm -hmm. And then I think a lot of people go through 
you know, a lot of pain, a lot of mistakes, a lot of horrible things, but you're always faced with that choice. Am I going to focus on the positive? Am, am I going to see the opportunity in every bad situation? Because there always is. Or am I going to become that, you know, uh, that grumpy old man, you know, and, and I'm definitely at that point with just where my worldview and everything is changing. And, you know, I recently spent some time with my wife, Amber, in London for a anniversary trip that we went on. And for like two days, I was super grumpy to be around. I, I was just cynical and everything I was seeing, I was seeing in the light of kind of a nihilistic point of view. And I realized after a while, like, man, if, if Amber was acting like this or in this mood, I wouldn't want to be around her, you know? And I, you know, kind of looked at myself, like, am I going to, am I going to choose from here on out to just see the negative and everything and the pointlessness, or am I going to spin it in a way where I can just focus and think that everything's pointless and, you know, just, uh, doggedly materialist point of view. Um, and, and I think it just, for me, it starts to end, end all meaning and curiosity and exploration and, and it eliminates the pull into the wonder of, of what is. And I think that pull into the wonder of what is for me engages that creative side, that questioning side. Um, and to bring it back around, I think there's that point where you come to putting that mask on. And I think that point in your life when you realize you have to take that mask back off yeah. to a large degree and <laughs> expose yourself to the world. There's, there's that point where you realize these masks, you know, they, they maybe got you through a time and maybe served a purpose in some way, but to be honest about the whole thing a little more so and to make yourself vulnerable uh is is some part of that maturation process and in coming to that point i think you have the opportunity to dive deeper into more masks and to pretend that everything's perfect but i think when people go through that that real deep maturation process they start to see the beauty and the imperfections the you know the beauty in in being vulnerable sharing you know yeah. Um, and, and I think that's where a lot of really great art comes from is, is expressing the questions, the fear, the hope, the loss, you know, embracing all of that is where a lot of real beauty comes from, uh, you know, the, the, the whole, the whole spectrum of life, you know, being embraced, uh, and felt and admitted to is, is where we get the, the most beautiful uh, expressions of creativity and art and everything else. Oh yeah. I, I feel like I, you always look back at stuff you've done in your life and go, Oh geez, what was that all about? Um, I love your dining table. I love the table that, that we designed that, um, we designed in your first office when you were an architect. Um, I, I loved making it. And there's not a lot of defective wood in that. It's, it was, it was pretty perfectly, uh, exec it was relatively perfectly executed compared to what I'm doing now, but it's the use that made it imperfect. It's the it's it's the years and years of of just n not putting any finish on it and having it be the center of a home. Right. And but what I'm really trying to speak to is we oftentimes as artists look back at different periods in our life and what we were doing. I have a piece called the cat piece that I brought to the. Um, fine furnishings show in Rhode Island in 2007 12 years ago it's in a tent that I keep random stuff in I can't throw it away 
It was originally priced at $6,000. It's made out of fiddleback redwood and wenge. I think I remember that piece. It's a stunning wood. Stunning. It was well made. Um, I hate it. And that's a strong word, and I mean it. Um, I've tried to sell it for $500. I've tried to give it to people. They're like, no, my ceilings aren't high enough, but it's a beautiful piece. It Is that was that really tall piece that has those yeah. handles that curve yeah. out? Yeah, sculpted handles. Yeah, It's a failure. That piece was a failure. And I didn't know it at the time. I just did what I did. And we all look back at different work that we've done in our lives and say, like, like there may be, there may, I have an architect friend who sometimes looks back at buildings he designed and goes, oh, geez, where was I at when I did that? And it's not about trends as much as it's about whether something's good or not. And for some reason, some things are good and some things aren't. And I'm, not, I'm just not going to sit here and say, that I haven't had failures. I've had a, I've had quite a few. Does in design, in 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 every aspect of my life, I've had failures, and I I think it's important not to have a lot of shame about it. No, I you know I I think placing them in a in a place of failure, but being open about it and learning from it is the most valuable thing. Yeah. You know, being being open about like, yeah, no, I'm naturally a very self-centered person, and yeah, <laughs> by at least keeping that at the forefront of my mind, I can start to uh, give of myself more. Interestingly, about that piece, it's one of the times when these folks in Boston's, I had built a bunch of pieces for them. Um, they, they said, yeah, do your thing. We trust you. And when I sent her the picture, she said, I'll pay you for that piece. But you keep it. <laughs> I this is the one that... Yeah. Wow. It's a family in Boston that I was working for. And uh, they were collecting um, built-ins and you know, for beautiful, beautiful home they had in Newton. Uh, I was their main cabinet maker and they were really happy to have me. Hmm. But that piece did not fly. <laughs> and there was supposed to be another piece that came of it. So I had the same flitches of veneer and everything to make a duplicate piece for the other side of the room. Right. And she said, don't make the other piece. Nope. <laughs> you keep that one. And I'm buy, I'm, I'm going to buy, I want you to, to do something else. And I made something else that had a lot of bronze and, and a lot of um, crotch mahogany veneers. And it was, it was a completely different deal thing. Yeah. And I took that piece to the show and... I thought I sold it to a few people actually, and it, it just didn't go. And now it's still sitting there. Just every now and then I open that tent up, I roll up that door, and I go, Just staring at you. You <laughs> messed that one up. Look at you. <laughs> and I want to burn it someday or do something with it, but. It's perfectly fine as a cabinet to hold old books and just old, old like instruction manuals for, you know, machines and whatnot. It does its job. It's just. <laughs> so all the veneer I put into some other pieces that I actually gave away to some, some really good clients in Kenny Bunkport and whatnot, just some little, little pieces and, and. It's funny that when I was playing, like I said, I, you know, I was playing with the veneer, you know, a year later, this is probably, I don't know, 2008 or 2009, and some good things came from it. Um, and and uh, you actually 
I don't know. We, I have to have you over at Susan's, Susan's house because um, there's a bunch of, she, she's collected a few of my pieces and I want, I want to document them. Yeah, cool. Uh, but um, I, I'll be able to show you what, what came of it. Nice. A little bit. Because I think it's important to play. Oh, yeah. And I'm, I mean, I'm, I, Tim and I were just talking the other day about personal projects as a photographer even. Um, but just in general to, uh, you know, explore creativity without someone else's money being on the line that puts that pressure on you to just, you know, uh, create. And, you know, both of us are essentially commercial artists to a degree. Yeah, we are. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's always that weight over your head of someone's paying you to execute an end result. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, you know. So to take the opportunity to um, create without that over your head, I think is is extremely important for for commercial artists, especially. I mean, if you're a if you're an artist that just I do whatever I want and I put it out there, and sometimes people pay a lot of money for it, then you're just kind of always doing that, and that's your deal. That's fine. Uh, but specifically for commercial artists it's a different ball game where yeah you know. that's something i actually wanted to when i was going over a little bit of like an overview of what i wanted to say about design um for me you know i touched on it a little bit when i said you came to the shop and you said i would like to see that part of that bench sculpted into the bench and i was like nope not going to happen. Well, a few weeks later, it happened. Right. I find, and you're not my client, but I find that listening to people and um, especially the client, I mean, I, I get myself into tons of hot water if I'm not, if, if I'm not, if I don't keep my ears open. I, I can be pretty bad about that too. I can have yeah. kind of a preconceived idea and a vision and I can already know what I'm hearing and I'm not hearing it, you know, and that I've had people with me, um, on like scouting trips for shooting or stuff that have afterwards criticized me and said, dude, you were not listening in that regard. And this was like a yeah, Probably that ge I'm ago. a genius ego thing comes back and, you know, it, it, it's, it's important. I, I've been working with a, a woman in Portland, you know, talking to her for an hour every week, call it therapy, call it whatever you want. She's actually a, a shaman and she's, she's incredibly powerful and she's, she's trained in Nepal and whatnot. And she's also a, a clinical psychologist and She's taught me about how good it is to have ego. And I was like kind of ashamed of it for so long. I was like, ooh, my ego is getting me into all kinds of trouble. Hmm. You know, it's important to have that. That's what gives you, I think, the vision and everything that you have and, and makes you as powerful as you are. But you also, you just need to know when to be, you know, have some humility and listen. Right. I mean, that, yeah. that drive, confidence, uh, but moderated. Yeah. Right? It, yeah. There's, it's all yeah. things in moderation. It, it, like, I keep coming back to that idea, which I think reflects uh, or casts a light on creativity that's important. Um, the, the idea of, you know, I don't, when I really get down to it, I don't think there's specifically good and evil as much as there's imbalance. Oh, yeah. So anything Absolutely. that you could call good could become evil, and anything evil could become good. It's just the degree at which you take it. So like cobra's venom or poison, whichever it is, it's injected by fangs. Uh, in you know, micro, micro, micro doses does certain things and treats certain cancers or something like that. But, you know, at yeah. another level, it kills you. You know, there's... You know, people will say that, you know, any any time you kill someone, it's it's evil. But obviously we've we celebrate the killing of, you know, millions of people as a accomplishment through World War Two or whatever. You know, there's 
there's mm. instances where these different levels of things are just perceived as good or evil depending on you know the outcome or the degree at which they were executed and it uh that's always a concept that i've had a hard time with as far as like um perfection that's where i don't i don't get it like perfection it's hard to, perfection really is just balance to me now i'm i'm redefining my idea of perfection to be more so in balance rather than all things perfect it was my i can't believe you ended up on balance because i almost brought this piece of paper with me this morning because I wanted to talk more about psychological issues than I wanted to talk about design um, because I knew I was going to be talking to you and we always have great conversations about it. This piece of paper has the word balance in the very center. Mm -hmm. And then there's a circle and there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of concepts like within that circle. And then there's some concepts outside of the circle. And it's just been something that I've been, I didn't write, I didn't, I didn't do this thing, this, this piece of paper thing that I'm talking about. I, it didn't come from me. It's something I found. And, uh, but that word balances in the middle. Careful. And I think the idea of balance as perfection is, is it's that's that's really cool because because balance is something I've struggled with my whole life it's something that I say to many people I'll say jokingly balance is incredibly foreign to me I'm either over here or over here or, yeah right um, but what I want to talk about beyond that is what's inside that circle and what's outside that circle and I think what you're talking about when you speak of like you know, things that we've done as, um, as a country in wars and whatnot. Um, we need to, we need to, we need to look at, um, whether we're acting from a place of maturity or a place of immaturity. And I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that an eight year old can't act from a place of maturity. What I mean is there's immature and there's mature manifestations of all of these qualities. It's sure. very hard to say that there's a mature or an immature version of balance. Um, and, and I guess, you know, this is probably better, better talked about in another time, but I think, I think I'm having a really hard time with the idea that I'm maturing and I'm getting older and I'm not going to be a rock star and I'm not going to be famous. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it, at a certain point we, we go, Oh wow. You know, is maturity this wonderful thing? Well, I'm starting to celebrate it and I'm starting to think it's pretty cool. I mean, you, again, you look at, all these people that are like fame is probably one of the worst things that can happen to oh, a yeah. person. Yeah. I mean, look at all, Oh, geez. There, there's somewhere in there. There's the balance of freedom and peace that is rock star. that, you know, the idea of like, well, I'll, I'll be happy and I'll be fulfilled. And, you know, happiness peace fulfillment is going to come from when those you know those important relationships are at their best and if you're at out at some level achieving uh like we were saying earlier at, at that level where you're um you're giving so much of yourself but uh robbing from those that are closest to you you end up feeling deeply deeply alone and that's where you know, that's where people end it, you know, that. Yeah, that's, that's exactly where, um, I was last spring and that's why I wanted to do the twos thing. I wanted to tell the world 
how important I thought uh, pairing was, how, how deeply hurt I was that I no longer had a partner. And I wanted to start exploring why. And I did it through the work. And you know, because you said it to me once, you asked me how I was doing a few months ago. And I said, I'm having a really hard time, you know? And you said, yeah, a lot of my friends who are no longer married are also having a really hard time. And a lot of friends that are married. Are there's a big time. TED talk on, on um, happiness and how a lot of people who are alone are unhappy. But I've learned that, I'm, you know, this is going to sound really trite. And I got to get going soon, but I've learned that it's really important that I'm enough by myself mm. before I can really be in relationship and be successful. Right. And I might have skipped a few chapters when I was uh, working to where I was. So I got to go back, reread a few things myself. And now, you know, I say I don't want to do certain things because they're not emotionally connecting. You know, I, I'm not getting anything from it, you know, as far as like the perfect work that's out there and, and all that. But. The next time I get, the next time I get in a relationship, I really want, I really want to, I really want to be soul deep with somebody. I really want to look, I want to be able to look at my partner and see, see into their soul a little bit and really feel connected. And, um, if I'm, if I start doing that by, by doing that with my work or whatever, so be it. You know, but I think that's, that's like a healthy process. Of, pretty of heavy. Doing that. It's pretty heavy stuff to talk like this. Um, but what's the point in doing it if it's not? If it's just, if it's just a mask relationship. If it's just like, hey, you know, I I really want to I want to be authentic. I've always wanted to be authentic my whole life. I want to be in love. I want to be, you know, I want to. I want to really do this. And if I can't, I'd rather just skip it. And, but it, it is hard, you know, and, and you, you said the word hope earlier. And I, and I love people who say the word hope every now and then, because a lot of the reading that I do these days and stuff is like, oh, we got to do the dance of hopelessness. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I don't want to be Buddhist about this. I don't, I don't, that's not how, that's not the direction I want to go in. I like hope. I agree with you. I, 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 yeah. I don't know. To me, losing hope is, uh, yeah. it, there's something about feeling that there's wonder, mystery, and hope in front of you. And I, you, there's not a, empirical factual nature to that but it's just part of life that some people gravitate towards and embrace more than others and mm. other people embrace a more uh, maybe nearsighted feels like it's a condescending term but there's other people who can focus on the empirical factual data and find meaning and fulfillment in that and i'm struggling with figuring out uh you know how i can accept and allow myself to project into that unknown uh mystical wonder with without insisting that it be empirically proved and all that and 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 embrace a approach of hope when it's not um empirically grounded which which is a is yeah. a whole different thing but as you said you got to get going and this has been a really good conversation yeah I've, it's been a good 
Let's, I think it we, I think we did a good one here. I think this is going to be <laughs> We done good. We, we did a good, good. We did a good pod podcast <laughs> whatever it is. Cool. Well, I, I hope you're able to eke something out of it. Oh, we will. We will. Thank yeah. you for coming in at 6:30 a.m. Yeah. Do you have and, any idea uh, what time it is? It is uh, 8:15. Okay. So Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks so much for everyone listening and watching online. Yeah, Subscribe. Check out Derek's work at... Oh, uh, DerekPreble.com. DerekPreble.com. None of the new work is on there, though, so... Uh, well, maybe by the time this is released, it will when be. When will this so. be released? I don't know. I think it's probably going to be late summer, September, or Okay, DerekPreble.com. DerekPreble.com. Thank you for watching and listening, and look for... Derek's article in the upcoming issue of Maine Home Design that this will be released along with. So thanks cool. again. Always All good right. talking to you. Thanks.